Acorn TV, proud sponsor of Just Seen It, offers hundreds of hours of British mysteries, dramas, and comedies streaming commercial-free on demand. Learn about our 30-day trial at acorn.tv slash ptv. On this episode of Just Seen It, we review TNT's crime drama, Mob City. Frank Darabont is back, this time replacing The Walking Dead with Talking Gangsters. We chat with Honus Boran, screenwriter for Gravity. The idea was to be able to create a movie where for 90 minutes you had the audience grab to their th seats. We review the crime thriller, Out of the Furnace. I personally love directors who make audiences feel extreme emotions. In the biopic, Mandela, Long Walk to Freedom. The film really takes off once Nelson Mandela is put in jail. All right here on Just Seen It. Mickey Cohen battles the police for control of 1940s Los Angeles. These latest rumors of corruption are an attempt to undermine confidence in this city's police department and my administration. But neither side is willing to back down in this true-to-life drama. It's the job. Some things go right, some don't. The stakes are raised as the casualties grow in TNT's new series, Mob City. Hi, I'm Salim. I'm Rachel. And I'm Sean. Mob City is the new TV series on TNT created by Frank Darabont. We've all just seen it. Rachel, what do you think of Mob City? I think it's a really great show, actually. It's got some of the same problems that a lot of pilots have, which is you have to introduce us to everybody, and they've really done that in the pilot. They've introduced us to about 40 different characters. There's a bunch of police people, a bunch of civilians, a bunch of mobsters. That being said, it's a little bit hard to follow at first, but pacing slows down and smooths out. And especially by episode one, you really get to take a lot of time with each character. You start to figure out what's going on. There's some power struggles. I find it to be a very good show so far. Let's talk about the showrunner a little bit, Frank Darabont, who we all know from The Walking Dead, which he did a couple of years ago, but even more so from The Shawshank Redemption. So I've been a very big fan of him for a while, and I'm glad to see him back after he was unceremoniously uh, fired from The Walking Dead. The show, the pilot, it's good. The mm -hmm. very first half of it, it's a little bit uneven, mm -hmm. though I think it really comes into its own at the very end of the show. I'm not going to say what happens, but it really catches me by surprise and definitely propels me into the second episode. I like Frank Darabont a lot, too. I've actually liked everything Frank Darabont has done, even yeah. The Majestic, which had some yeah. problems. But I didn't get why Frank Darabont wanted to make this material. This feels like 1940s film noir cliches. Every single scene in the first two episodes feels lifted from some other movie or mob trope that I've seen a thousand times before. And so I'm going, what is Frank Darabont doing to spin this material into something new? And so far, he hasn't given me anything. I was trying to figure out how is this any different, especially because it's Frank Darabont. He's going to bring his own signature spin to it. But I think what he's trying to do is bring us back to the old school noir and really use that aesthetic for the whole show. There's a lot of music. There's a lot of voiceovers. So that's why I think you're feeling that it's been done before. It's because it has. He's really trying to bring us back to that aesthetic. Am I under suspicion of something? Am I being held? No, miss. You're free to go anytime. Then what do you want? Insight. You're with the man. Do you want to see his killer brought in? Look, if I could help, I'd say so. I was really afraid that this TV show was going to be more so like Gangster Squad and not like LA Confidential. Unfortunately, Gangster Squad to me was drivel. It was sometimes comedic, and sometimes this show in the very first episode is a bit comedic. But what that movie didn't do, it didn't showcase the police corruption in Los Angeles, which I think this show, by the, especially by the end of the, the pilot, really, it looks like it's going to be talking a lot about that. Everybody's trying to make the next hit TV show, and they've all been done before. But this show, to me, I think the strength of it is the characters and, and the acting. Because what you have is, you have actors who are cast against type, which that rarely happens. You know, you have Neil McDonough who's playing this very good guy. You have guys who usually typecast as good guys playing bad guys, guys who are used to playing villains who now have to rein it in and play good guys. And there's such a depth in these characters, but it's done, I feel like, a lot better than some of the things that are on 
TV right now. And well, and speaking of actors going against type, that's maybe the one thing that I didn't like about oh, really? it. Uh, well, just for example, John Bernthal. He is from The Walking Dead. He played Shane. He was also uh, recently in the movie Snitch with uh, The Rock. In both of those two cases, he plays this very manic, on the edge type of character, and I think he plays those characters very, very well. In this one, he's the the straight edge, typical leading man, which I don't think he's at, that strong at. I'm going to repeat myself, but it, <laughs> even the acting, it feels like uh, this guy trying to do Humphrey Bogart or this guy trying to do Sam Spade or Philip Marlowe. You know, the, the way these people talk, the way they even wear their hats, the way they carry around their badges. If you want to see cliches well done, Mob City does it well. Frank Darabont knows how to do these cliches, but I don't find the characters that interesting because I've seen the characters before, and I don't find the setting or the plot that interesting because I've seen it before. We have historical characters in this, but we do also have some fictional characters. Alexa and Milo are playing two characters that were invented to give this some new life. Mickey loves having his picture in the papers, especially with celebrities. We had George Raft and Ava Gardner in the other night. Nice. Not just famous people. Nobody's too. Next time you're in, I'll take your picture. Simon Pegg, for me, in the pilot, was amazing. I I was expecting him to come in and play some British, you know, guy who right. really doesn't make sense in the story. Or be comic relief. Be, or be, I mean, he kind of is because he plays a comedian, but he plays a, a tragic comedian. His character and his role might be what people remember from the pilot the most. And that's not saying that the pilot's not, you know, good. It's just that Simon Pegg is that great in this role. And don't confuse me for upstanding. That's not what this is. It's a winning hand. My whole life I've been dealt crap. Finally, I got a royal flush. Finally a win. That's what this is. My ticket out. This looks specifically shot on a studio backlot. Yeah. I think that's part of the point, but it's there. I mean, mm -hmm. The production values, there's a shot at the beginning of the first episode, the pilot, where there's an L train going in the back, and it clearly looks like that is being put in in post-production. It doesn't look genuine at all. I think that Darabont is doing that on purpose to echo these 40s gangster films and film noir with these prison movies that he's done, with The Walking Dead. He's taken familiar genres that people know about mm -hmm. and he's spun them in new and different ways. Yeah. Maybe Mob City could do this. So far, he has not spun it for me at all. It's entrenched in the roots of, of 40s noir. I was expecting a lot more from Mob City, a better title for one, but because of the talent involved and the aesthetic, I'm gonna give it a chance, see it. A solid show with well-developed characters and a jovially violent tone. I give it a see it. Mob City features a very familiar population. It's a nice place to visit. I just don't know if it's worth living there yet. Stream it. So our votes add up to two and a half tickets, which is a see it for Mob City. Cheers. Ah, see? <laughs> <laughs> Wise guy, man. Ah. Beautiful, don't you think? What? The sunrise. Terrific. Hi, I'm Aaron. Hi, I'm Jonas. And I'm Zoriana. Today we welcome a special guest, Onas Cuaron. He co-wrote Gravity with his father, Alfonso Cuaron. Welcome to the show. Thank you. So my first question is, where did the idea come from? The idea was to be able to create a movie where for 90 minutes you had the audience grab to their th seats, where the action and the suspense never stopped, but where that didn't mean that you couldn't also talk about different themes and juggle, uh, have almost a philosophical discourse. So what made you decide on space? I mean, that's, that's quite a very specific topic. Were you interested in space? Do you know much about it? By the time we wrote the movie, our main concern first was to create a, a character and a journey. Space came secondary. It just seemed kind of to be the best setting for the story. We wanted a movie where the setting would become a metaphor for a lot of what the themes the character's going through, and space seemed a perfect setting for it. It's a place where you're literally separated for, from the rest of human life. Is space confining for a story or expansive for a story? In a way, it was very expansive. There was lots of, at first I was really scared because when you start with a movie of two characters floating in space, you think like, what am I gonna do with it? There's not go, much yeah. they can interact with. But then you start realizing that the physics of space and the actual space exploration, like what we've created, and it's very rich. Some help there, man. No, don't wait for us.
So what was it like bringing this idea to your father? Had you brought ideas to him before? Were you nervous? It was a weird process because we didn't plan plan to do it. We started talking one night about this type of movies and the idea of doing a movie like this, and it turned into an all-nighter, and then next thing I knew is I was writing the script. That's awesome. And how do you write? Do you guys write together, or do you both go do certain scenes and check in with each other later? Is there a lot of emailing back and forth or late nights with coffee late. and... A little bit of everything. We we came up with the story over that first night, over the course of that whole long night. We knew exactly kind of like all the plot points and the, the specific things that happened. And then it took like a month where, since we were in different parts of the globe, we did it over Skype. He got the, ni- he got the nice hours. He got morning to night <laughs> and I got night to morning. But Was the main character always supposed to be a woman or was it... A, a, a male. No, since the first draft, you know, I'm pretty bad at coming up with character names. So the first draft it used to be called the woman, uh-huh. and we knew we wanted a woman because it's a movie about a character's journey, and in that journey she reaches a rebirth. It's a movie about rebirth and how, by overcoming adversities, we can have almost a a metaphorical rebirth. So we wanted to have this female presence that kind of like became a metaphor for this fertility and this source of life. Did you even anticipate that you'd be getting credit for creating a strong woman character in a time where Hollywood complains that there's not enough of that? Well, at the point I was just creating this character, then I have to say, you know, I owe a lot to Sandra and like the job she did is amazing. When we started writing, we knew it's a movie where part of the gamble we wanted to do, like part of our idea was to make a movie where only one character carries the whole emotional drive for the audience. And you know what, the theory sounded nice, but as a writer I kept being really scared that like people would just not connect with the piece. And I think that's something that Sandra did great, which she made that character so human that it allows us to be in the in the journey with her. Mm-hmm. Houston, this is mission specialist Ryan Stone. I am off structure and I'm drifting. Do you copy? So what was it like when you were actually on set or, or collaborating with your dad? Did you did you still feel the father-son thing, or were you guys, you know, on equal ground? In that sense, I have to say my dad's a great collaborator, because, like, at the moment, we every time we would sit down to write, it was just about collaborating and hearing, hearing each other's ideas. Mm-hmm. And if we would ever disagree with something, I tended, I tended to think that that's where the best ideas came, because we would disagree and talk and a third idea would come up. So in a way, that's why I like elaborating with him because the hierarchy disappears and we get to be horizontal for one. And what have you learned from your father's career or some of the mistakes or things that he has made that you can now apply to your filmmaking career? Never make a movie in space. (laughs) 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 Unless you want to spend five years developing technology to make it happen. Hey, the time paid off. It's a <laughs> yeah. wonderful film. Thank you Excellent. very much. Excellent. Thank you so much. Cheers! Cheers. To gravity. In honor of the 15th anniversary of its original theatrical release, my DVD pick is the hidden gem, Living Out Loud. Written and directed by Richard Legravenas, the movie tells the story of Judith, a middle-aged woman living in New York City and struggling with loneliness after her husband leaves her for another woman. But what really makes this movie sing is the fascinating cast of Holly Hunter, Danny DeVito, and Queen Latifah, who I really want to call out because at the time she was known as a rap artist, but she ended up playing a red-hot blues singer. Be a wise man. Treat me tender, I'll be cruel. The three develop a close friendship that guides them each through their troubled waters. I highly recommend this movie and would love to hear your reactions. So see it 
and post your comment on our YouTube channel or Facebook page. Deeply in debt, Rodney gets involved with an underground fighting ring. I just need the money. You're gonna be a good boy and take a dive. I'm not gonna have to teach you a lesson. When he disappears, his brother Russell decides to track him down. We're gonna get one shot at this guy. You ready for this? Russell must decide to take revenge or play by the rules in Out of the Furnace. Hi, I'm Rachel. I'm Liz. And I'm Sean. Next up is Out of the Furnace, starring Christian Bale and Woody Harrelson. We've all just seen it. Rachel, what do you think of Out of the Furnace? It's clear, it's simple, there aren't any cheats or tricks, and I think the performances are strong. We have technical prowess, we have a director who has a strict command of tone. I mean, the first half of the film was as tense as a horror film. I love, and by terrifying. the way, I love the first half of the film. Yeah, absolutely, it was great. And then the second half of the film, things unraveled, as I feel like the director intended them to. But you don't go into this and leave and think, well, <laughs> Yeah. Great time. Right, with, drive -in the, with the drive-in theater. And I wonder if he's trying to echo the sentiments of some of those films, which were very visceral and violent and didn't necessarily make you feel very good, uh, which this doesn't. But it did work for me because of mainly the cast and the performances. Scott Cooper, the director who made Crazy Heart, does know what he's doing and, and does handle this material very well. So what we have is we have, you know, the first half of the film, we set up Christian Bale's character of Russ Bayes, as a really good man, or a man trying his best to be a good man, in spite of all these extenuating circumstances. And it makes you feel for the character. And the script continues along that line until it gets to the point where it's a little sadistic. And it throws our main character that we've grown to love so much into these all these horrible situations. It's purposefully sadistic. So I really enjoyed the first part of this film, but then you get into some things like some very heavy-handed metaphors. Hunting. Hunting metaphors that play out for a very long time, and you know what's going to happen. And actually, there are some twists to it still, but I just feel like some of these moments get so highlighted that I'm like, okay, you're losing the subtlety that you had in the first half. And I wasn't necessarily always sure why characters were doing what they were doing at any given time. It does manage to find itself. It does manage to work, despite the fact that it's so unapologetically grim. I thought it should have been called Stuck in the Furnace and not Out of the Furnace. <laughs> Burning in the Furnace. Burning yes, in the Furnace. I mean, actually, some people walked out while I was watching this. It was like, and not because it was bad, but just because, you know, it's one horrible thing after the next after the next, and they're really, it doesn't let up. <laughs> I think I'm running. I'm gonna run. I'm running. Get away! <laughs> Go! <laughs> oh. Christian Bale was just amazing. He's so subtle, he's so underplayed. He has love, and I think that's the most important thing. He has love for his girlfriend, he has love for his brother, he has love for his father, and that's what keeps you really connected to that character. That's what breaks your heart. He's got lots of love for Woody Harrelson, too, in this movie. <laughs> Woody Harrelson. Oh, Woody Harrelson. the most terrifying oh, person I've ever seen on screen. And I was very surprised at how effective of a villain he was because he had all the traits of your stereotypical villain. I mean, he's walking down the street with a lollipop. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Every time he came on the screen, I got really nervous. Every time he was up there, it was just like I wanted to punch him, and also I was like... <laughs> Did your mom teach you to barge in my cap? You got a problem with me? I got a problem with everybody. I enjoyed more so the subtle performances, not so much the lead performances. Zoe Saldana, as you mentioned, I think that she gives her best performance she to date. Wonderful. And Forrest Whitaker, it's not a terribly flashy performance, but this is Forrest Whitaker as I've never really seen him before. He's not going to get a whole lot of accolades for this mm -hmm. performance because it's a small role, but I was like, I wouldn't have even thought that that was Forrest Whitaker necessarily. The ending of this film is set up in a certain way where you have expectations that aren't necessarily met. I would say the majority of audiences will be surprised by the ending. And it felt like Scott Cooper was doing that because he could and because he wanted to, to he wanted to create some sort of visceral reaction from the audience. It does show Scott Cooper's talent. He seems to know exactly where to put the camera for maximum impact. And even though I didn't 
necessarily fall in love with this movie. I am curious to see what Scott Cooper does next. For great performances from Christian Bale and Zoe Saldana, but a kind of heavy-handed third act, I give this movie a stream it. Out of the Furnace keeps all the hope firmly in the fire, but the great performances make it worth a recommendation if you're willing to stomach it. See it. Out of the Furnace takes you to a very dark place. It's not an enjoyable film, but it is an achievement in storytelling. So I say, see it. Our votes add up to two and a half tickets, which is a see it for Out of the Furnace. To the Furnace! Cheers. Cheers. Do not take your children to this movie. Nelson Mandela is a young man in South Africa fighting for equality. We are the people of this nation, but we don't have rights. After he is jailed, he and his wife Winnie become the symbols of anti-apartheid. Together, they change South Africa forever in Mandela. Hi, I'm Salim. I'm Brenna. And I'm Aaron, and today we're here to talk about Mandela, Long Walk to Freedom, starring Idris Elba and Naomi Harris. You've all just seen it. Salim, what'd you think? I was actually really excited about this movie, mainly because it's starring Idris Elba, one of my all-time favorite actors. Finally, he has a role with a lot of meat that he can sink his teeth into. However, because he's so famous, it was hard for me to believe him as Nelson Mandela, especially in the first half of the film, because to me, he just seemed like Idris Elba speaking in a South African accent. When he's playing a 20-something-year-old Nelson Mandela, it's hard to shake off the a very adult presence that Idris Elba has, especially in the thing that he's most famous for, which is Luther. Mm -hmm. Most of the problems that do exist in this film are in the first half. Mm -hmm. It's trying to set it up, yeah. but it, set, it takes too long to set it up. Yeah. It's too long to be an effective flashback, but it's also too short to be effective shot as it is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so you have these shoehorn domestic issues and this tiny little family thing just so it can be relevant that he has a son. Mm -hmm. It just wanders a little bit. William Nicholson wrote the script. He's written Nell, mm -hmm. Gladiator, yeah. and most recently Les Mis. So he's a great writer, and I think that the scope of this film is fine, but it's just really hard to pinpoint what I, what I wish the first half yeah. had or what it was missing. And the first and half could have been done in flashback. It, yeah. it didn't feel as urgent or as important as the second half. I guess, yeah, it, yeah, it just didn't need to be that exactly. long. And it's intriguing because this is directly an adaptation of his memoirs. One of the producers of this film, Mandela specifically told him, because he's a South African, that he wanted him to make this movie, which I, which I enjoyed, and which yeah. is I, why I enjoyed also them really telling us about his idiosyncrasies, the fact that he was a philanderer, because it's not hero worshiping, it's really showing us that he is a man. And it assists for the second half of the film seeing his arc into this kind of wise revolutionary, going from this passionate revolutionary to this more yeah. you know centered man. And that's peaceful. The, that's, peaceful. Exactly. That's probably the most interesting thing to watch for me. I mean, while he's in prison, how society and specifically South African society changes around him to the point where he was in prison for something twenty something years beforehand. But then the government is is trying to get him out mm -hmm. and say we need you. And I think it all culminates in a scene when he meets the president of South Africa at the time and his shoe is untied and a white person gets down on their knee and ties his shoe. There's a lot of great symbolism in this film. You have that scene and then you have another scene in the beginning when they show him going through mm -hmm. a rite of passage yeah. with his tribe mm -hmm. and he has he gets covered in, in like a clay and then he goes and washes it off and washing it off is symbolic of him becoming a man. Mm -hmm. Later he's working in the quarries in prison gets covered in clay because he's doing manual mining, yeah. and then he goes and washes it off. There's yeah. a second rite of passage, and there's these little things like that that make it so stunning. Yeah. What I think is probably the, the most interesting character in the whole entire movie, his wife, Winnie, yeah. played oh. by Naomi mm -hmm. Harris. She mm -hmm. starts out as such a meek, cute, young little girl, mm -hmm. and, and he, they fall in love, and then he goes to prison, and, and her story is just so fascinating. It's a shame that the movie that came out about Winnie Mandela this year starring Jennifer Hudson wasn't very good because I would have loved to see a whole movie about her. Her and character change is fantastic as well. I mean, mm -hmm. as you said, she started off and she's sweet, and this is in the, the, the problematic first half, with this super cliche romance between her right, and Nelson. Right, which I didn't really like at all. Yeah, like walking through fields in sundresses oh, and at sunset. Flash, and all the flashbacks shot but, yeah. with the overexposed sunlight. Yeah. But once you, get to the, once you get to the end, though, it all, all of that actually assists in the... In and how much more emotional the end of the movie is, and I is, think. Uh, yeah, well, it, it assists in setting up their relationship. We are negotiating. We are not fighting a war. But the people have chosen to fight. Do you want me to betray our people? Do I betray our people? You have been away a long what? time. What does that mean, I've been away? Does that mean now you can terrorize people? 
Our director is Justin Chadwick, whose previous credits include The Other Boleyn Girl and a, a thick helping of uh, television from England. He's a TV director mostly. His first film was called The First Grader, which actually took place in Kenya. So it showcases that he has a love for this continent, which you can see on screen because it looks very beautiful. The directing is a little oversimplified, mm -hmm. especially in the first half. Yeah. We have when Winnie and Nelson first meet, we have these very cliche, brightly lit, running through the field, romantic yeah. shots. The score at times yeah. is very heavy handed, just it's, hammering emotional beats. But it's, it's fascinating because these things that we, we, we have problems with in, in the first half are still used in the second half but because the second half is better, we're okay with them. Yeah. The yeah. score is far too sweeping in the first half, but it's spot on in the Yeah, it hits the emotional beats correctly. Uh, it's trying, uh, all of the directorial stuff in the first half is trying to make this film better than it is. Or at least the first, first 45 half. minutes. Well, well, no, but like you said, it's setting up and it's and it's kind of apparent how much of a setup it is. Like yeah. you, I think you made a great point that it was, it could have been a flashback with all the information that they showed. It could have been, been a been montage. Could have been a montage. But again, getting to the end of the movie, I don't know if that if those scenes weren't there, if it would have been as emotional. The power of the second half and the fantastic performances more than make up for the problematic first half. So I say, see it. A bit of a bumpy start. However, the final execution and overall importance make you forget any initial missteps. See it. I agree with the both of you. It's not a perfect film, but the performances, and in particular Naomi Harris, are simply fantastic. So I also say, see it. Cheers. 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 Mandela. To Naomi Harris. <laughs> I realized that there was really a lot of reallys in that really? really long and really not very good bit I just did. You know how to whistle, don't you, Steve? <laughs> it fuels the furnace. <laughs> but then we go out of the furnace <laughs> and into the fire. Acorn TV, proud sponsor of Just Seen It, offers hundreds of hours of British mysteries, dramas, and comedies streaming commercial-free on demand. Learn about our 30-day trial at acorn.tv/ptv.